Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to this new episode of uh, Stage Makeup Friday, Season 3. Uh, my name is Julian. I'm a dev advocate focusing on AI and machine learning. And once again, please meet my co-presenter. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ségolène, and I'm a senior data scientist working with the AWS Machine Learning Solution Lab. Uh, my role is to help customers get their ML project on the right track in order to create business value as fast as possible. Great. Thank you again for being with us. Um, so as you know by now, uh, we meet twice a month and uh, we discuss real life machine learning use cases and we try to solve them using Amazon SageMaker uh, and we focus on the latest capabilities that were launched a few months ago at reInvent. So we are 100% live. We're still in the Paris office. Um, we won't use any slides once again, just one recap slide at the end with resources. And, uh, and we'll spend lots of time running code. So uh, we have um, uh, friendly moderators and expert <laughs> moderators today. Once again, thank you for helping us. And uh, they're here to answer all your questions. So start right now, uh, keep them busy, ask your questions, don't be shy. There are no silly questions. Um, so what are we going to do today, Sego? So, uh, Julian, if you remember well, in the last episode, uh, we automated an end-to-end -end machine learning workflows with SageMaker Pipeline. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. a super good yeah, episode. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this week, we are going to change topics. And uh, we will show you how to train uh, natural language processing models at scale, thanks to the Yugin Face open source libraries and to the new distributed uh, training techniques uh, available in SageMaker. Okay, yeah, it seems that this season we have a bit of an NLP obsession, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, computer vision, you know, yeah, we've, we've done that. We've done we'll come that. back to computer vision and show. So we're just obsessed with NLP right now. Um, yeah, and hugging face too. It's pretty cool as you will see. So uh, let's start nice and, and can you, just explain what NLP is and, and what kind of uh, business problems can customers solve using NLP? So NLP first means um, natural language processing. So plain text. Plain text, exactly. Okay. And it is really one of the very promising, promising fields uh, in machine learning. Not a month goes uh, by without a new breakthrough. Mm, yeah, it's very active. Sure. Very active yeah. community. And indeed, uh, thanks to uh, the increasing uh, computational capabilities, uh, researchers now train complex deep learning models on very large text data sets mm -hmm. and can extract context from uh, unstructured data. Okay. As a result, um, applications such as search, uh, mm -hmm. sentiment analysis, sentence comparison, text summarization, chatbot, and of course, uh, translation, translation are now uh, commonplace. Yeah, and, and those uh, use cases are really super popular and, mm -hmm. and lots of companies and organizations need to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's really a lot of research going on on and trying to build always, you know, new models and more sophisticated models, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And uh, in this respect, the recent uh, transformer uh, deep learning architecture mm -hmm. has proven very successful and has spawned uh, several state-of-the-art model families, such as text-to-text uh, -text transfer transformer, the famous T5. Oh, T5. Yes, generative pretending, GPT, mm -hmm. and of course, the uh, bidirectional encoder representation from transformer, the BERT one. Ah, the famous BERT. <laughs> the famous yes, one. and of course, we're <laughs> going to talk about BERT today. Um, so, I know, you know, because I read the articles and the blog posts and so on. And so transformers are definitely state of the art mm -hmm. for, uh, for NLP. Um, can we try and give our, our friends today uh, a, a reasonably simple explanation on transformers and, and how they work? <laughs> yes, of course. So um, in their seminar research paper uh, entitled uh, Attention is all you need, uh, published in 2017, mm -hmm. the inventor of uh, transformers, of the transformer architecture, highlighted the fact that uh, until recently, the dominant sequence model were based on uh, complex recurrent or convolutional neural networks, mm -hmm. such as RNN, LSTM, or the gated one network. 
Okay, and then these have been around for a long time. Yeah, and, exactly. And they work because, well. Yeah, yeah, they work well. They yeah. work well. Okay. But um, in order to get around the sequentialness of uh, RNN architecture and to improve the computational efficiency, mm. the authors propose a new type of attention based network. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, <laughs> now, now I'm lost. Okay. <laughs> So attention, uh, attention, attention, <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> so what does attention mean, please? Yeah, so I, I, I want to know. <laughs> so attention is a, in the, is a mechanism that forces the model to learn, to focus, mm. to, or to attend on specific, specific parts of the input sequences. Okay. Self-attention is a mechanism where every word in the input sequence is analyzed within the context of all other input words. Okay, so what's the main benefit? So, for instance, the benefit is uh, one of the main benef benefits is going to be able to solve the polysemy problem, okay. where the same word can um, have a different meaning based on context. For ah, example, I see. Okay. yeah, the word tie can be a verb to attach. Mm -hmm. Or a no. Yeah, the tie. The tie. tie. Okay. <laughs> yeah, when you go to a job. Okay, because you look. Okay, you look at the at the context of a word, next to all, not just in, with respect to the next or mm. the previous words, but all words. Exactly. Right? So you kind of context. expand the. Okay, you kind of expand the, uh, the the attention that you give to each word in in the full sentence. Exactly, and when you okay, take into that. account right. this full context. Uh, one other benefit of the attention mechanism is the ability to understand long-term dependence, dependency, mm. and that is to say the relationship between words that are far apart. Okay, I understand that. Okay, because LSTMs would look at, I would say, neighbor words, neighboring exactly. words, mm -hmm. right? The first few words before, first few words after. But if you have a word at the beginning of the sentence that is related to a word 200 positions later, mm -hmm. then you, LSTMs would not. Okay, I think I get it. Uh, thank you for the reasonable explanation. So this thing is the basic building block of transformers. Exactly. Right. And um, the transformer architecture relies entirely on a self-attention mechanism to compute representation of its inputs and outputs without, without using sequence align, RNN, or convolution. So you use only self-attention mechanism. And thanks to this new architecture, uh, transformer models are able to achieve certain results. Okay. And as it is usually the case, this new architecture inspire other models such as the famous BERT. Okay. So again, uh, BERT means bidirectional encoder representation transformer, and it's a variant of the transformer architecture using only the encoder parts. So you can have a look at the paper if you want to know more. But uh, BERT now can be used uh, for many NLP tasks. Mm -hmm. It has also uh, many flavor, flavors, sorry, uh, which have been uh, optimized for particular tasks, like uh, Roberta, Distil BERT, XLNet, and even a Camembert. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah, that's the French uh, flavor, <laughs> the French. And Camembert. If you've never tried it, you gotta try it. It's just the, the best French cheese. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it looks like it's so it's not a cheesy model, okay, but that's a cheesy <laughs> joke. But I had to make it. It's right. Okay, I had to make that joke. Okay, enough uh, stupidity. <laughs> so these are super nice models, super efficient. I mean, again, we all we've all read the blog post, we've seen the demos. But every time I try to to use them as is, you know, I find them very intimidating and a little bit difficult to mm. to to work with. So. How can we use them? Can and how would we use them? Do we have to train them from scratch? Yes, you could. However, uh, this would be a quite uh, rather challenging task. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, we are talking about large models. Yeah. BERT has 340 million parameters, mm -hmm. and you will need a very large data set to train them with a good level of accuracy. In fact, the original BERT model was trained on the entire English Wikipedia and on the uh, book corpus dataset. Okay, so, so how big is that? <laughs> three billion words, if I remember. Yeah, right. English Wikipedia is probably big. Three, more than three billion words. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's pretty big. So that's pretty big. So uh, you understand that cleaning and preparing that much data is a project in itself. Then you will need quite of a, a bit of infrastructure. 
uh, to train the model mm -hmm. in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Even with eight powerful GPUs, it can take about one week to train a uh, BERT. Wow, okay. <laughs> so sure. Uh, we have... not, not super cheap as well, right? Okay. <laughs> So uh, we have because I'm 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 lazy as you know by now and I'm I'm also very cheap. Okay. <laughs> yes. So um, we have all seen uh, the benchmark on training BERT uh, in an hour, mm. but uh, the amount of infrastructure required is staggering yeah. and completely out of reach for the huge majority. of yeah, benchmarks, you know, yeah. I always say benchmark are, are, benchmarks are only good if you can actually reproduce them yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah <laughs> if you put 2,000 GPUs and, and train BERT in X minutes, okay, that's great, but can I do it? No. Can customers do it? Nah. So, <laughs> fine. It's, it's, a, it's a benchmark that doesn't help. Yeah, right? exactly. And after, uh, if you think BERT is problematic, then what about the T5 model mm -hmm. uh, with its 10 billion parameters? Billion. Billion. With a B. B, with B. Mm -hmm. Or the GPT model with its 175 billion parameters. Can you imagine that? No. no. <laughs> I, I don't think I want to. Okay. Uh, I, I was, let's stick with BERT today. We have enough problems already. Okay, so so what do we do? We just fire up a training job and then we wait for uh, a week and we play video games while the model is training? Well, what's the story? I'm sure you would like that, yeah, well. but absolutely not. Ah, I'm disappointed. <laughs> no, but the huge majority of ML teams don't train from scratch. Okay. Instead, they use transfer learning and fine-tune pre-trained models on their own data set. Okay. This, has, this has two main benefits. Mm -hmm. The first one, as model parameters have already been trained, you don't need a lot of data. Okay. Just enough to specialize the model on your own business problem. Okay. Second point, likewise, you don't need to train for very long. Typically, just a handful of epochs. Okay. Thanks, to, thanks to this, your training times uh, will be hours at most, mm -hmm. definitely not weeks. Okay. So. Yeah, transfer learning is, is a great technique. I mean, this is really similar to what we've been doing for our years, I guess, on computer vision, you know, grabbing mm -hmm. pre-trained models mm -hmm. on ImageNet and, and fine-tuning them. It's, it's really the same thing we're doing. Exactly. And that, this is exactly the same techniques. Uh, for NLP, uh, Wikipedia is a very popular data set to pre-trained models. It's very large and available in almost every language you can think of. Okay, so what would the workflow look like? So it's very simple. First, we will download we will download sorry, a pre-trained model. Mm -hmm. Then we will prepare our own data according okay. to the input format uh, that we expect. Okay. Then we would we would write a short fine-tuned script and mm -hmm. run it. Okay. Finally, we would get the fine-tuned model and use it in our app. Okay. Yeah. So very similar to what we've been doing for a long time. Mm -mm, exactly. So. Um, I guess my next question is, uh, so where can we find those very sweet state-of-the-art pre-trained models? Where, where are they? <laughs> well, they are available in the usual model zoos, uh, such as the TensorFlow Hub okay. or the PyTorch Hub, and of course in SageMaker Jumpstart. Okay, so which, which we've covered, right? Did uh, we? I forgot. Sure. No, I think, okay, I'll, I'll check. <laughs> we will. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, the number one place to find them is the Yogging Face ah. uh, Model Hub, a huge collection and most up-to-date collection of uh, NLP models. Okay, Hugging Face. So uh, I'm okay. sure you, you're. Uh, I'm sure you've heard that name many times. So let's dive in, and um, uh, I'm going to share my screen, please, and uh, um, let's look at the collection of models. Okay. So you should see um, you should see the the, the collection of uh, of models here, and uh, and it, it's pretty big, right? It's it's really you know thousands and thousands of models that we see. Let me actually reset completely. Yeah, it's over eight thousand, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, so let's try and find um, just a, a random model. So how about a summarization model? 
uh, trained on the English language. Okay. And uh, yeah, we see there are quite a few, right? Uh, which one do you want to try? Anyone, this one? Yeah. Um, and so we see here, uh, of course, there's information on the model and you know where it comes from and metrics, et cetera, et cetera. And the really cool thing, what I really, really like about this uh, Hugging Face collection is you can try it out right mm -hmm. there. So. Um, you you actually can run a sample here. Try and run this. And uh, is this not the Eiffel Tower? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> See, you can't you can't escape us. And uh, yeah, it's a lucky accident. Um, so you can run. You know, you can try and summarize, and and you can try and uh, uh, you know answer questions, etc. You can you can try them out just like that, right? So you can explore. Um, and let's try maybe I don't know, question, question answering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in French, why not? English. Oh, Camembert. Here it is. <laughs> okay, let's try Camembert. And yeah, question answering, as you know, is you know you ask a question, you provide a piece of text that contains mm -hmm. the answer, and uh, and the model will find the exact uh, part of that uh, document that answers the question. So you see how easy it is to to use this. this like I said, you know, it's over eight thousand, and um, uh, the uh, hugging face folks are are adding models. But you know, very importantly, the community, the open source community, mm -hmm. is contributing lots of models. So um, so this is what it is, right? Um, it's not just a model zoo, right? No, it's not just. Uh, after it, what it is interesting is that you can uh, filter uh, everything by the, the use case you want. Mm -hmm. and, um... So what else can we do with Hugging Face? Oh, so, um, there is a lot of things that uh, we can do. And uh, because uh, Hugging Face is uh, developing user super popular open source library uh, that make it easy to download, train, and predict mm -hmm. with this model. And you can find them uh, on GitHub, of course. Yeah, so we see um, so we see the libraries, and they have plenty of repos. But I think the the most important, important. ones, the ones we're going to use today, Transformer. are transformers, mm -hmm. uh, data sets, mm -hmm. um, and tokenizers. And don't worry, we'll uh, we'll come back to that. So should we do a hello world example? Let's okay, go. all right, let's go. So let's go and open page and let's rename a bit. And the, the code is on uh, is on uh, GitLab. Yeah, we'll when? share. Yes. Okay, this is the one. Um, so this is a really simple one, but just to give you a sense of what Hugging Face is, and then of course we'll do slightly bigger things. Um, so first of all, we need to install uh, the Transformers library, which gives us access to all these models and uh, and data sets, because of course we're and uh, so this is just the, it's, this is really the hello world example from mm -hmm. the uh, Hugging Face documentation. So here in just, you know, one, two, three lines of code, we can uh, download a state of the art pre-trained model for sentiment analysis. And of course here, there's a, a default model that we download. We don't even give the model name and, uh, and we can predict with it. And as you can see, we don't even prepare data, right? We don't have to do any processing because this is part automatically of that pipeline, right? Where input data is transformed and predicted. So I don't think you can be any simpler than this. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, which which line of code you do would you remove? Ah, none. Okay, so perfect, right? Now, of course, uh, you can go and grab a particular model. And you can say, yeah, I want this particular model here, right? And let's uh, open this. Okay, you tried it. Uh, this is easy. And this is the one you want and great. Okay, so how do you use that? Well, you just give the model name and uh, this is actually multilingual uh, sentiment analysis. So with the same model, we can do sentiment analysis on um, French text. Uh, and on the English text. 
this sentence here means exactly the same as here, and we can see the obvious one. So you can do this with uh, any one of the 8,000 models, mm -hmm. okay? Two, three lines of code, and, and you can print. okay? Um, so this is nice, right? Uh, and it, for a lot of people, it works just like that, and they don't need anything else. But probably you want to fine tune those mm -hmm. on your own data. And then there's a bit of an infrastructure problem, right? <laughs> yes. Um, because these are very complex, very large deep learning models. Mm -hmm. And so we we need GPUs to, to train them, even if it's just fine tuning. Uh, and of course, you may have quite a bit of data to fine tune on. So maybe SageMaker can help. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm just asking. Uh, can we easily use a hugging face on, on SageMaker? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, what a surprise. <laughs> so, yes, no, we, we recently added a yogging face estimator to SageMaker, hmm. and now it makes it very easy to trade and fine tune models at any, sc any scale using on demand infrastructure. Okay, so basically, the way this works, as you will see, is extremely similar to other frameworks mm -hmm. available on mm -hmm. SageMaker. Uh, so, if you're if you've seen a previous episode where we train with TensorFlow or PyTorch mm -hmm. or Scikit Learn, etc., you will be very familiar with what we're doing today. Okay, so we're going to talk again about uh, a hugging face estimator. We're going to talk about script mode mm -hmm. uh, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, obviously the prerequisite for this is to understand how you can fine tune mm -hmm. one of those models. So there's a very good example of that in the uh, hugging phase documentation, which uh, you see on my screen here. And uh, so this is part of the transformers library and this code snippet is really what it takes. So um, you would import the model that you want to fine tune, mm -hmm. right? So here we want to use BERT for sequence classification. And this is the particular one we want. This will download it and it will be initialized with those weights. Um, and then the trainer API lets us fine tune that. So we pass the model training arguments, which are, you know, how many epochs, batch size, technical parameters. And, you know, what, what's the training set and what's the test set. Mm -hmm. So this is a very friendly, I guess, very easy API. And, and as you will see, you can run this stuff exactly as is. On stage maker. So let's uh, let's jump to a, a notebook and see how we can do this. And once again, this shows um, taking existing code, existing machine learning code that runs on your laptop or your office machine, is and running it on SageMaker is not a lot of work, mm -hmm. right? which is fine. That's the way it should be. <laughs> okay, uh, so. Here we're going to work on sentiment analysis on product reviews, uh, but we've already used the Amazon uh, mm -hmm. customer reviews data set. So I figured, hey, let's let's change and let's show you how to use data sets in Hugging Face. Okay. So we're going to use one of the data sets uh, in, in Hugging Face. We'll see this. Okay. And we're going to use uh, Distilled Bird. Okay. So let's get started. Uh, all right. Install dependencies, import SageMaker, the, the usual stuff. So first of all, of course, we need data mm -hmm. and we need data to be, as you mentioned earlier, in the format that BERT. Mm -hmm. And we'll see that format is, is very small. So here I'm going to work with this data set called generated reviews, E-N-T-H, which means English Thai. Ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's it's a, it's an interesting one. So we can download it. It's already split for training and test and, and validation. Cool. Uh, we see so the training set is about one hundred forty-one thousand samples, which is I would say medium size. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and the, we'll use the validation data set. I will not use the, the test. So this is what data looks like. Uh, so actually, the purpose of this data set is you could use it for uh, sentiment analysis because we see uh, we see the review and we see a star rating. Mm -hmm. 
but you can also use it for uh, you know translation or or uh, say bilingual work on English and, and Thai because this uh, correct teacher tells us if this uh, translation, this English translation, is actually a correct translation for this Thai language. So interesting. Uh, we should, we could certainly use this for for different things. But here we're just going to use the English part because we could very well use the Thai part. But I don't speak Thai, so it would be difficult for me to understand if we're doing a good job. But feel free to use Thai, and you can explore the data sets. There are many many options. Um, so the the format that Bert expects is um, two features, mm -hmm. right? Very simple: the text. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, a label uh, that says uh, zero one, right? So positive, negative. Yes. Okay, it's binary classification, if you want. So the first thing we need to do is to, to apply this modification. So here I've decided that if a review is four or five stars, then it's positive, mm -hmm. and if it's one, two, three stars, it's negative. Again, it's because I'm using a model that's just uh, a bird version for uh, binary classification, but we could do multi-class uh, if we want. So I apply this change to the training set, the validation set. Uh, and then, uh, so now I've got my label, uh, which needs to be called labels, right? That's what bird wants. Mm -hmm. Okay, so don't forget that. Uh, and then I just want to get rid of the of the Thai uh, sentence, but as you can see, this is kind of a nested uh, feature. So I flatten that JSON document, and then I just remove uh, the correct field, the translation dot th field, and the and I rename the translation dot en to text because that's what. Okay, and then we get to this. <laughs> which is what BERT wants, right? So it's a simple format for, for Python, right? Okay, pretty cool. Um, the next step is tokenizing, okay? Because uh, we've discussed this in detail uh, when we work with the customer, the Amazon customer reviews. All those models do not want to work with strings, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Strings mean, generally mean nothing to mm -hmm. machine learning models, they need Tokens. Tokens, yes, of course. Are you following me? Yeah, some 100%. <laughs> okay, and tokens are integers, right? So we replace words, each word with a unique integer, right? Um, and as those models have been pre trained, mm -hmm. uh, they already have a tokenizer. So the, the tokenizer has already been trained on the input. So we can just, which is fine, we don't have to train one. So we can just grab. The existing tokenizer, download the tokenizer, and apply it. So we apply it to the training set, we apply it to the validation set. Now, if we look, oh no, now the training set looks very ugly. <laughs> uh, let's check this. So we still have the labels, of course, we still have the text. Honestly, we could have removed it, it's mm -hmm. not needed, but I think it's fine if you leave it there. It makes it easy to maybe to debug. And we see the input tokens, right? Each word has been replaced by a unique token. And the zeros are just padding uh, because BERT is, takes, uh, takes fixed length mm -hmm. inputs. I think it's 512 uh, tokens. So here, obviously, this review is not long enough, so we pad it with zero. Okay, and this is the attention mask. So telling BERT, okay, these are the words you should be looking for. Mm -hmm. So in our case, we take them all. Right, so all the words are considered for this uh, attention mechanism you explained. Uh, obviously, the, the padding values are in there. Okay, but there are certain tasks where you want to mask input words. For example, if you want to train a model on text generation, mm -hmm. uh, then you will uh, you will mask maybe the you know the the second half of the sentence because you want Bert. you don't want Bert to look at it. Okay, and then uh, we just upload this stuff to S. Now, you know what I'm going to say. Yes. No. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine to do this in the notebook, right? Uh, and when you're experiment, but once you debug that code, mm -hmm. where do you want to run it, Segal? <laughs> want to know. <laughs> you want to run it 
in SageMaker yeah. Process. Ah, SageMaker. my yeah. favorite service. <laughs> yes. So, um, so I'm not going to go through this. We've seen this already mm. so many times. I'm sure you're getting tired of it, but automating your processes is super important. And SageMaker processing makes it very, very easy to take that code in the notebook, yeah. put it in a script, just like this. You can see I'm doing really the same thing. I'm just adding command line arguments. Mm -hmm. And I'm saving the data to a local location in that container, and that gets copied. Then when we run this so many times, well, we get output minus three. And if we look there, well, we see our training set and we see our data. So again, um, if you've never done that exercise of taking notebook code and um, running it inside of StageMaker processing, I cannot recommend enough that you try it. Uh, it's it's uh, it's easy and it saves you so much time when you want to run those jobs again and again. You don't have to, and you can automate them and schedule them with lambdas and so on. And you don't have to click 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 in the notebook. <laughs> Be lazy. My advice. Okay, so uh, I'm actually gonna grab the output from Sage. Mm -hmm. And now I am going to use this. Uh, and uh, to fine tune the model, we need a fine tuning script. And again, this is pretty much what you saw in the documentation. Mm -hmm. We download, we start from a, a model, and we use we define training arguments, and we create a trainer instance, and we train, and then we evaluate on the validation data set, and then we save the model. So this is again, this is vanilla hugging mm. face code. The only thing we're doing is we are using script mode, remit this, mm -hmm. to pass parameters, uh, to pass the location of the data sets and the location where to train. Okay. Again, you've seen this. If you if you're thinking, man, he's been saying this for 20 episodes, you're absolutely right because and I keep saying this for 20 more episodes because this is how you do it and this is what you need to do, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not complicated, right? And you have many examples to look at by now. So this is the training script or the fine tuning script. Okay, no problem there. Um, and so now we can run this. Okay, so now we can run this. Um, so first we're gonna run it at very small scale. We're going to run on one epoch, just to see what happens there. Uh, so we run on one epoch, our batch size is 32, and the model we want to fine tune on is distilled bird phase and key. Okay. And these hyperparameters are past the script using <laughs> script mode. Well, <laughs> <keep on. laughs> right? Yeah, you need to figure out the script mode sage maker processing, right? I'm always asking the same question. <laughs> the same thing. So it's very easy. Right? I, don't, I, I don't have a lot of imagination, <laughs> especially on Friday. Okay, so what am I going to say now? I'm going to say, look at my t-shirt. Can you see my t-shirt? It's Friday. We, we, we have a right to be silly. So actually, Sego <laughs> made me a t-shirt that says, SageMaker is business as usual. <laughs> and there's estimator code, right? So see what I have to go through? <laughs> And actually, I'm wearing it, so that tells you how silly I am. So <laughs> it is absolutely sage maker maker business as usual. Sure. <laughs> okay, because we have this new estimator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's called hugging face, as we'd expect. Uh, we pass the location of the script. Mm -hmm. We pass our hyperparameters. Um, we pass the version of transformers that we want to use, and so. Um, you need 442 or higher, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, this is uh, 442 is the first version that works with SageMaker. Uh, PyTorch 1.6, um, Python 3, your infrastructure requirements. So we'll just go with one GPU instance with a single GPU. And because I'm cheap, I <laughs> want to use Spark <laughs> instances. Okay, I think we've covered this before. Yeah. Okay. So we'll try and grab that P32XL. And uh, we're examining the profiler, which is a capability we haven't talked about, uh, probably in one of the next episodes, because we don't really need that. And then we call fit, passing the location of training and validation. 
And so it trains a little while. Okay, so we see trains for about a little less than an hour, right? So that shows you, okay, and that's one epoch, right? It's one bird epoch on a smallish mm -hmm. to mid size mm -hmm. data set, right? One hour. Uh, but as we use spot, we only pay for a thousand seconds, which is about. It's about 15 minutes, right? <laughs> a little more than 15 minutes. And so we have a very nice 70% discount. And especially if you work with GPU instances, which are, uh -uh. you know, uh, slightly more expensive than uh, CPU instances, but they're really the only ones we can use here. Uh, you really want to make sure you use spot. Okay, so about an hour for one epoch. And we should look at maybe accuracy because we didn't. Find it. I, I'm sure it's uh, it's it's actually in studio. I should. Let's look in studio. All right, going off script. Going off script. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those. It's the one. It's what is this one? That's it for an hour. Okay, so I see my cross entropy mm -hmm. because I think that's the only one I love. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think the evaluation accuracy is also all right. So we train this for one epoch. Now, what do we do with it? So this is a relatively relatively new feature, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't support deployment on SageMaker. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, we cannot call a hugging phase dot deploy, mm -hmm. but you know, coming soon, That's right? It. Trust me, I'm 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 has, I'm repeatedly asking for it, so, and everybody else is so it's gonna come, okay? But it's a good opportunity to show you how to grab a model and predict with the model locally, which I don't think we've shown you before. So we can copy the model, okay, mm -hmm. from S3, and that's uh, let me show you what this looks like. It's a model.tar.jz artifact, and if you extract it. Uh, you have the model here and checkpoints automatically. High torch checkpoints. Okay, so that's good, but this is really the one thing we're interested in. And we have the model configuration, and this is important because it's going to help us locally. <laughs> okay, so now uh, now I'm working locally, quote unquote, right? I'm, I'm actually working in studio, but mm -hmm. here, okay, I'm, I'm in my studio environment. So this is exactly the same as my. A loading perspective so so i can load the model just like that mm -hmm. right grabbing the the config grabbing the, the, the parameter weights mm -hmm. and if i print the configuration i'm going to see some some parameters on the vert so i can see the number of dimensions for the formal layers uh yeah the uh, max size of the sequence so mm -hmm. 512 right and and some other parameters vocabulary size do. And then we see the actual architecture. Mm. Not going to go deep here, um, but if you read the research paper and compare it to this. And we see the self attention. Uh, yes, yeah, we see, yeah, we see the attention yeah. layer and, and we see the all the blocks mm. that are uh, connected to one another. Yeah, and again, if you look at, if you see a, a, a diagram of yeah. BERT, uh, you, it's pretty easy. Uh, to you see the uh, yeah to relate to that stack now. And the, the interesting thing is obviously at the end of BERT, in this variant of BERT, we we add uh, an output layer that uh, reduces to two output features because we want binary classification, right? So these are this is where we'll get our property. And we can try it. So using the same tokenizer that we downloaded earlier, we can try and tokenize uh, this, uh, this review, right? And okay, so these are the tokens that we predict locally with those tokens and we print the output. So mm -hmm. those two values here, mm -hmm. we print them out here. 
And we see they don't look like probabilities because they are just uh, raw activation values, right? So if we apply a softmax function to that, mm -hmm. and softmax is a simple math function that transform vector into probabilities mm -hmm. in the sense that they will add up to one. Mm -hmm. And we apply to those uh, to those outputs, then we see, okay, then there's no doubt the highest probability is class number one, and class number one is positive. 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 If I try the other one, hope my notebook will not fail me. Let's see what happens here. Uh, yeah, okay. Then predict this thing, apply softmax again. Yeah, good. See now. Yes, the um, top probability is class zero, and so this is very negative review. <laughs> I want my money back. Yes. <laughs> yes, I want my money back. Okay. <laughs> so this is uh, this is how you would do it, right? Mm -hmm. And again, I think it's it's simple because we've already seen those things so many times, right? Uh, script mode, estimators, uh, etc. So the only thing we're missing is deploy, but yeah, hopefully it's going to come very soon. Um, Okay, so here obviously we train on a smallish data set mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for one epoch. Mm -hmm. And it still took one hour on one GPU. So what if we want to train on larger data sets or if we want to fine tune for a longer period of time? Mm -hmm. What should we do? So um, as you know, SageMaker has included a distributed training uh, from D1 uh, using native capabilities available uh, in open source deep learning framework mm -hmm. as well as uh, in Rovod. Okay. But uh, at reInvent, a few months ago, uh, we have launched a new major capabilities that greatly improved distributed training at SageMaker. The first one, data parallelism, where mm -hmm. we automatically split data across the different GPUs of the training cluster. Okay. And the second one is model parallelism, uh, where we automatically split very large models that uh, would, not, would not fit on single uh, GPU. Okay, yeah, these are these are really good, and it's a good opportunity to revisit distributed training. Exactly. Uh, so let's start with data parallelism, Perfect. and uh, explain what it is, and see how we can add it to you. So, uh, as you said, distributed training was available in SageMaker from day one. So, mm -hmm. um, using the native capabilities. So, yeah. uh, if you train with uh, you know built-in algos, which mm -hmm. are uh, mostly implemented with Apache MXNet, then you use the distributed feature training in MXNet with a parameter server. If you train with TensorFlow, there's a native parameter uh, uh, native parameter server in TensorFlow. Um, use Orovod uh, as well, et cetera, et cetera. Distribution, distribution. So it has been there for a while. Now, the issue that uh, some customers have is they actually hit, you know, the scalability mm -hmm. limit on those parameter servers. Okay? Mm -hmm. So parameter servers are dedicated um, uh, instances, or sometimes it's one of the training instances that you have, and they're in charge of um, uh, splitting the data set mm -hmm. into as many pieces as you have training instances. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have, uh, or training GPUs. So let's say you have uh, 16 GPUs in your cluster. Uh, the parameter server will round robin the training batches across mm -hmm. the 16 GPUs. So each GPU gets one sixteenth of the training set. Mm -hmm. So you would see why this accelerates things because you don't train all the GPUs on one single split. And each GPU then sends results back to the parameter server, which consolidates everything and distributes results to everybody. And then the parameter server sends the next. Okay, so that's the the, the very uh, short explanation. The problem is, as you can see, if you have as as you grow the number of GPUs in your training cluster because you have a, a huge data set, mm -hmm. then the parameter server becomes a bottleneck. And so this is why we we worked on a new uh, distributed tra training technique, where we're still going to split the mm -hmm. data set, but we're going to remove the need. For that parameter server. And this is called StageMaker Data Parallelism. And we could go on for two hours. Um, but I'll I'll just refer you to the to the blog post that I wrote 
um, where I, you know, explained in a bit of detail what data parallelism is and the different generations of data parallelism and, uh, and what this new algorithm is. So basically, and I think it's very clever. So here we distribute the model training on the GPUs and we also distribute uh, the, uh, uh, the the consolidation and, and sharing of updates across the CPUs of those instances, right? So on your training instances, the, all CPUs uh, will collaborate in distributing updates to GPUs and all GPUs will collaborate on training. Mm -hmm. So you don't need that one, you know, victim instance that gets bombarded with gigabytes of updates coming from, you know, 64, 128 GPUs. So it's pretty clever, it's pretty clever. <laughs> so this is really quickly what data, uh, SageMaker data parallelism is, right? GPUs send their updates to all the CPUs in the training clusters, and CPUs consolidate and send updates to the GPUs. So you share, you share the workload, the training workload and the communication workload. So that's that's pretty cool, right? And you can read all the details in this talk. And you can say, whoa, 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 whoa this is probably crazy to set up, right? Uh, do I need to install anything? Well, what's going on here? So, um, and well, the answer is no, <laughs> <laughs> right? The answer is this is actually very simple to use. Yeah. Okay. So remember how we did distributed training in the past? Uh, we would just do this, right? Ignore that last line. We would just say. Hey, trade on two P3 16XL instances. We would just, as soon as the instance count would be higher than one, then mm -hmm. we enable distributed training. And this still works, right? Mm -hmm. You can absolutely still do this. Now, if you want to use data parallelism, you need that one line saying, please enable data parallelism. Isn't this beautiful, <laughs> right? Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Sure. It's, it's, <laughs> It's very cool. It compares the CPU blog post. It's super cool. Yeah, and and under the hood, you know, this uh, distribution of computation and communication automatically works. So you don't have to worry about it. And you don't even have to read the blog post. If you can't be bothered, you just add this line and it works. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty cool. And then we train again. Okay, uh, and we'll see. Uh, if you want to read the log, you're going to see uh, the different the two instances being set up. See here, okay, we have two hosts because we have two instances, and we use MPI, uh, the, the message passing uh, interface, to mm -hmm. let them communicate. And we have quite a bit of uh, information here, and we are actually training for longer. Right? We have more. Yeah, we're training for eight epochs. Okay, mm -hmm. just so we have a total of. 16 GPUs, mm -hmm. okay? Each one of these has eight times two, that's 16 GPUs running for eight epochs. Find the end <laughs> of this extremely long training log. By the way, there's a flag to disable the log in the notebook. If I should really have used it here. Okay, we see we train for an hour and five minutes or something like that. Um, so we train for a little longer than mm -hmm. we trained in the initial job. But remember, we train on eight epochs, yes. right? So we train for eight times longer mm -hmm. on 16 GPUs and it's a little higher, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so it's not perfect scaling uh, because ideally, um, you know, we have uh, we have 16 GPUs for eight epochs, so um, this should be uh, yeah. So ideally, we should see half half the time, right, mm -hmm. of that very first job that we run. So here we see approximately the same time. Um, I haven't optimized this yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm guessing if I started to improve, you know, batch size. And if I started tweaking a bit, I could get much, much better results with this. Okay. But out of the box, 
Okay, mm -hmm. we get we get a pretty nice speed up already without even tweaking things. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and of course we can always tweak. I'm sure, we'll spend an episode tweaking with a page maker profiler. Ah, and, yeah. yeah, we will certainly do that. <laughs> uh, and we still get seventy percent discount. Okay, and again, yeah, this data set is not huge. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so training on eight epochs for this is a bit of a waste of time. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually don't improve the accuracy much. But if you had a really, really big data set, uh, big data set that you would need to train on you know, 16, 64 GPU, whatever, uh, you would get very, very nice speed up. Here, it's not the best example of that. We only have an hour, and I can't go into all the tweaking details. Um, OK, so that's data the parallelism, analysis. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, yeah, I, don't, I forgot to say. Um, if you want to, as an exercise to the viewer, <laughs> uh, you can run this using native distributed training, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. And and compare. yeah, and compare. And, and trust me, this version, this new data parallelism library, is much much faster. The speed mm -hmm. up compared to the previous version of distributed training is very impressive. So you can you can go and experiment, and you can let me know what you what you find. Okay, we have one more thing. Right. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this model parallelism thing. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about that. Uh, and, and this is a bit different. Mm -hmm. Okay. So data parallelism is my model fits on a GPU, but my data is so big that I want to send different chunks of data to different GPUs. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another problem where, as you said, the model is so big mm -hmm. that it doesn't fit in the GPU. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to imagine. Right, BERT is uh, how much? How large? Uh, 300? 300, 340. 340 million. million. And it's about, about 300 megabytes, quoting from memory. So it will definitely fit. Mm -hmm. But those billion scale mm -hmm. models, yeah. they will not fit, right? Or hardly fit. Or they will fit, but you will have to work with a very small batch size, mm -hmm. and then training is slow, everything is slow. You, you, you can't increase the parallelism. So that's what model parallelism looks like. And the one thing we do automatically again is we chunk, we, we split the models, the model in different chunks. Right? So the layers, remember those BERT layers we saw, we'll just split them in different chunks and we'll train those different chunks on different GPUs. So divide and conquer. Divide and but this time we divide the model. And this looks a little bit crazy because if you you know, slicing data is easy to understand. Slicing the model then creates the problem of how do those different slices talk to one another, mm -hmm. right? If I slice BERT in four, mm -hmm. then, okay, I've got part one, two, three, four, or zero, one, two, three. And, you know, part zero needs to be linked to part <laughs> one, which, you know, you know what I mean, right? And that's not something we want to do manually, which is what people do these days. So we use model parallelism. Okay, and let me show you again really quickly what this looks like. Again, uh, this is my, my blog post. And here, in this example, we have two GPUs, mm -hmm. and we slice the model in two. Mm -hmm. have partition one, partition two. And we add an extra layer of parallelism by splitting the training batches into micro. We have two copies of each partition. So what this means, and I'm going a little fast here, more details in the blog post. What this means is on the same partition, you can run forward propagation and backward, backward propagation, propagation at the same time. So this means you could have different micro batches at different stages of that pipeline. Mm -hmm. For example, micro batch N could already be almost done N plus one could be still backward propagating on another partition, et cetera. Okay, so this is super efficient mm -hmm. because you can uh, you split the model, but this doesn't come at the cost of oh I need to run my data in partition one. Mm -hmm. Oh, and now I need to run my data in partition two. Oh, and now I need to do it in three. Okay, it's it's gone, and now I need to back propagate. So I'm back propagating <laughs> three, and then I'm back propagating <laughs> two, and then I'm back propagating one. So that would work. You could, you know, but all your GPUs would be running in sequence, mm. right? So you would solve the 
model size problem, the awful stuff. And here we just parallelize everything because all the GPs are busy running micro batches forward and backward and on those partitions. This is, this is really cool, right? Again, lots of details here uh, if you want to zoom in on, on this data. And the way this works, again, very simple. Uh, so here I'm just running for one epoch. Uh, you need to set up those options and they look a little bit intimidating, but yeah. the, the, the main ones you need to, to worry about are how many partitions do you want? Mm -hmm. So here we're going to slice BERT in four mm -hmm. chunks. How many micro batches do you want? How many copies of each partition do you want? Okay, make sense? So here we have four partitions, two copies of each, okay, and we have eight GPUs. So mm -hmm. That means each GPU is going to run two copies of one of those four partitions. Okay. Yeah. So we actually have uh, multiple copies of the same partitions on two GPUs, because yeah. you have eight GPUs and four partitions, right? Make sense? Hopefully. Um, and there are uh, other parameters on how to allocate partitions to these particular GPUs and, and a few more things, but generally these are the ones okay. you, want to, uh, you want to decide. And again, this is a bit of a theoretical exercise because BERT does fit mm -hmm. on a single GPU. Maybe we'll come back on another episode with a GPT or G5. <laughs> if, you know, yeah, if I'm, yeah. If, <laughs> if somebody convinces me I should spend the time to do this, why not? And then, stage maker business as usual. This time, we just need to enable a model parallel. And yeah, MPI again, which is the, the method passing that is used here. Okay, and we fire up that job and it goes on happily. <laughs> Tells us lots of things and we get to, wow. Okay, so we did one epoch in 1000 seconds. Mm -mm. So that's uh, almost four times, yeah. Three, three and a half times nice. faster than our initial job. Mm -hmm. Okay, but okay, we used eight GPUs, mm -hmm. right? But this shows you by, you know, splitting, uh, but it's still a very good speed up, uh, by splitting the model in different bits and replicating those bits across our training cluster uh, and having micro batches, you know, we keep the GPUs extremely busy, mm -hmm. right? And we would need to zoom in on how busy they are, they are et cetera, but we'll, we'll do that when we look at profiling. Um, but you can see this is very, very efficient. This is a nice, very nice speed up. So, so then, you know, it's up to you to decide, you know, what your budget is, how, 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 how long you need to train for to get the accuracy that you want, you know, and then you can either use a single instance to train, or you can use uh, data parallelism to train if, if you have more of a huge data set problem. Or if you work with large models and BERT is not huge, but we can already see good benefits here, mm -mm -mm. you could try model parallelism to try and split. And to make things even more confusing, of course, you can combine <laughs> model what parallelism and, and data, data parallelism. parallelism. So here I could have enabled uh, the PyTorch data distribution mechanism, which is native to PyTorch, but that would be a little too much, right? <laughs> and we are almost out of time. So there you go, that's the end for today. Uh, you have a couple of minutes for questions, so don't wait. And it's time to wrap up. So say, well, quick recap, what did we do see today? Screenshot, screenshot. Oh yeah, yeah, screenshot <laughs> time, screenshot time. Yes, yes. <laughs> screenshot time, of course. <laughs> so, so today we, um, we we see how to use uh, Yugi, Yugi, the new Yugi interface capabilities of SageMaker, plus uh, how to do some model parallelism and data parallelism and screenshot time. Screenshot time. So go and learn everything you can learn about hugging phase. Go and try the models. Uh, the code that we ran today is on GitLab as usual. Stage maker docs to understand uh, model parallelism, data parallelism, and the two blog posts and that I referred to. Okay. So well that's it for today. I'm not quite sure what we do, what we'll be doing 
two weeks from now. Let's see. Oh, is it cost optimization? Yes. I think it's cost yes, optimization. Yes, yes. We'll talk about saving money because oh. I'm cheap. Remember? <laughs> and, uh, and we will have a special guest to yes. tell us about uh, a, a super cool machine learning project that, uh, that uh, his team built. And we'll talk about all the cost optimization features in SageMaker. So that's going to be pretty fun. Uh, we'll start from a big, uh, expensive uh, training job and we'll try to make it very cost effective. So it's going to be very fun. Uh, join us in two weeks. Thank you very much, Sego, for being with us today again. Thank you to all our colleagues who helped us organize this and, and uh, answer your questions. And of course, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you learned a lot. And uh, until we see you, keep rocking, keep rocking with <laughs> machine learning. That's another t-shirt. That's another t-shirt. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>